morning. I know it's raining outside, so I guess some of you are still sleeping. Good morning. <laughs> and welcome to our Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. Let's start off with an opening prayer. Most gracious and everlasting Father, the creator of all heaven and earth, we come humbly before you today to honor a time and a life of a, a man that moved in a way to bring about peace and unity in our nation. Lord, I ask for your hand to be upon this gathering today, that you bless each and every one of us and that you strengthen us and that when we walk out of those doors, Father, that we are changed not only for today, but forever. To bring about change in our communities and our workplaces and even in our families, that we'll grow together stronger and not apart. We thank you for this time and we give you all the glory. In Jesus Christ, holy name we pray, amen. <coughs> I'm just gonna walk off and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess nobody want to hear from you. You know, like, ah, I'm just, just forget about him, Kevin, and skip over it. I'd like to introduce you to our interim president. Um, he served with the KCTCS community for some 20 years. Unbelievable. Um, we have several employees that have served as long, but in his capacity, he's done many great things through the years. I am going to allow him to talk more, most about himself. I think he's pretty good at that by now. And so I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Sellers. Thank you for saying those nice things, Kevin. But for those who don't know, Kevin Harrison, uh, he has been very good to us the last six months. Kevin's an employee at Ashland Community and Technical College. is on loan here at Big Sandy as our Director of Cultural Diversity. And thank you for putting this event together today, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And let's give Kevin a round of applause for the event today. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> So when Kevin and I were talking about this, um, and he asked me to, about willing to talk and say something, uh, about 20 years ago when I was in graduate school, I read a book called Martin Luther King Jr. on Leadership, and it's by a guy named Donald Phillips. It's a paperback book. You can read it pretty quickly, and it's a fantastic book. And the book for me, not only did it help me shape what I thought a leader should be when you're in school and you're analyzing leadership, um, but the times I have went back and read parts of that book like we did for today it reminded me that some of those things I learned in this book are things that have stuck with me forever. So what I'd like to do today is read a little bit from um, the chapter called First Listen, Lead by Being Led, which talks about Martin Luther King's journey into leadership, and it also gives some insight of some principles that he used as a leader to make the biggest move and one of the biggest and largest moves in the history of our country. So I'll begin. Martin Luther King Jr. found himself standing smack dab in the middle of downtown Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy, the first national capital of the Confederate States. The building he was about to enter was the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the parish for which he had just accepted the job of pastor. It was his first, first professional position after leaving Boston University, and he took the job despite the resistance of his dad and his wife, Coretta Scott. Most people don't know that. But in 1954, Montgomery was a bastion of racial segregation. It had been that way for generations. It was part of a Southern culture. It was the way it was. People were used to it. Black citizens and white citizens, for instance, were not allowed to sit together on a public bus. If a white person took a seat next to a black person, the black person was required to stand in the aisle. Even though 75% of the company's clientele were blacks, they were always directed to the back of the bus, and by city ordinance, violators were, were subject to fines and imprisonment. Bus drivers, all of whom were white, were given the authority to enforce the rules. And through this authority resulted, as you can imagine, heated arguments and insults. For example, a 15-year-old girl, Claudia Colvin, who happened to be unmarried and pregnant, was dragged from a bus for refusing to give up her seat to a white person. For her resistance, the young woman was charged with assault and battery, along with violating city and state regulation ordinances. The incident occurred shortly after Martin settled into his new home. Interesting enough, upon his arrival, he placed, an exist he, he placed the existing racial situation in this city in the context of what was happening to our country 
and articulated this to the local residents. This was his first sermon he did this, okay? He said, it is a significant fact that I come to Dexter at a most critical hour of our world's history. At a time when the flame of war might arise at any time to redden the skies of our dark and dreamy world. At a time when men are experiencing in all realms of life disruption and conflict, self-destruction and meaningless despair and anxiety. For him, the human environment was the human environment in Montgomery was part of a national crisis and it would not be tolerated. He let it be known that he intended to do something about it and that he was expecting his parishioners to do something about it also. He hit the ground running, joined the NAACP local chapter, and was quickly first day elected to the, to the, to the leadership committee. <laughs> Talking about making a move. He also joined other social organizations. From the beginning, he said to a reporter in later years, I took an active part in our current social problems. During Martin's second year in Montgomery, an incident occurred that we all know, unfortunately, all too well. On December the 1st, 1955, Miss Rosa Parks, a 42-year-old Taylor's assistant, was commanded by a bus driver to give up her seat to a white male passenger, and she said no. She said later, uh, I really didn't want to move. There was no plot. There was no plan. I was tired, and my feet hurt. Don't our feet hurt sometimes? Our, my feet hurt. They took her to jail, and when she called home from jail, the word spread around the city like wildfire. E.D. Dixon, civil rights leader, lawyer, president of the NAACP, immediately rushed downtown and secured her and got her released on bond. The next morning, they telephoned every black leader in town and let them know what happened. They informed them that there was going to be a spontaneous boycott of the bus system. He also asked that everybody support the boycott. He reached out to Martin Luther King and detected initially some reluctance from the young minister's voice, even though Martin said, you could use the church basement for this building. Nixon then called Ralph Abernathy, pastor of the First Baptist Church, and they became fast friends with King and asked him to help persuade the young pastors, all the young pastors in the city to become involved in this boycott. That evening, somewhere between 50 and 70 leaders of Montgomery's black leadership met in the basement of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Martin Luther King Jr.'s church. Anyone who wished to speak was allowed to, but Martin remained silent. He listened, he whispered, he pondered, he was thinking. And two decisions were made that night. First, the ministers would launch at least one, a one-day boycott to show unity and support for Miss Rosa Parks' situation. And secondly, they would hold a community-wide meeting that evening to determine if everybody in the public would support this boycott for an indefinite intended period of time. The next day, hundreds of volunteers began spreading the word. Uh, some of the ministers, I love this, even went to the nightclubs <laughs> to spread the word that we're having this meeting and you need to be there, not just our churches. Over the next few days and weeks, Montgomery's black leadership team took five major steps that would result in the eventual success of their movement. These actions, these strategies are what made up key elements of the way Martin Luther King viewed leadership and some of these elements are shaped me and the way I view leadership as well. Number one, you set goals and you create an action plan. A specific plan was created to amplify a long-term boycott to make to where people would, would have other means of transportation until government officials agreed to their proposals. The three goals were, and I didn't know this till I read this book, here were the three things that they asked for. One, no rider should have to stand if there was a vacant seat. Second, bus drivers would have to be courteous to all patrons. And third, blacks could apply to be bus drivers. I didn't know that. That was the three things that they asked for. These goals and overall plan were conceived by a three-person committee, Nixon, Abernathy, and Edgar French, and later presented and approved by a larger team of leaders. The second leadership lesson, create new formal alliances. The leadership group formed an organization they called they that they designed to administer the boycott. They called it the Montgomery Improvement Act, the MIA. It was immediately accepted by everybody, and to his surprise, Martin Luther King Jr. was nominated as president of this new alliance. Those who supported him did so because they said he was very well liked, he was highly educated, and he was an eloquent speaker. Because he was relatively new in town, they said he does not have any tied interest to any particular group. And therefore, he had no known baggage. He had no personal agenda. 
In essence, he was something of a compromise, a middle-of-the-road candidate. He accepted the position right off but said, well, I guess somebody has to do it, and if you all think I can, I will serve. Number three, you must involve the people. A mass meeting at the Holt Street Baptist Church was held in the evening of the first day of the boycott. Rather than riding the bus, 99% of Montgomery's blacks walked, hitchhiked, rode horses, rode mules, and got rides and found their way to this church. There were so many people they had to put a speaker outside the church. By the time it started, thousands were in the aisles, thousands were standing outside. Reverend King, who was the president of the MIA, rose and gave a 15-minute speech and said, We are here this evening for serious business. We are, we are American citizens, and we are determined to acquire citizenship to the fullest of its meaning. There comes a time when people get tired, and we are here this evening to say to those who have mistreated us that we are tired, tired of being segregated, and tired of being humiliated. We have no alternative but the protest. Martin concluded that eloquently, taking the cause to a higher level, and he said, if we protest courageously, and yet the dignity with dignity and Christian love, then the history books are written in the future, and somebody will have to say, I love this, there lived a race of people who had the moral courage to stand for their rights, and therefore interjected a new meaning into the veins of history and civilization. Saying that before any of this happened, everybody, the foresight to see this. A business leader nominated Martin Luther King for president of the MIA later commented and said that this was a great awakening, and it was astonishing. Rosa Parks was then introduced, and it was notified that she paid her fine early that day for her crime of not giving her seat, and the fine was $14. Reverend Abernathy went to the microphone and read a constitution calling for a boycott until the MIA demands were met. Then a voice called for the people in the audience, and everybody voted for the approval. Number four, seek dialogue and negotiate. The next morning, a letter of formal negotiations with a copy of the people's three demands were mailed to the bus company and to the Montgomery City Hall. That afternoon, a press conference was held that said, these are our demands and we expect these to be met. City officials met, met with the group, but told them, we will meet with you, but we will accept none of your demands. Although the MIA and Martin Luther King was initially angered, they became more determined ever than this quest. And, and philosophically were concerned with the reaction of the white majority. He recalled, of the, he recalled one of his favorite philosophers saying, growth comes through pain and struggle. It's okay. Growth comes through pain and struggle. Over the course of the boycott, MIA leaders would seek additional negotiations. On occasion, they would speak to the positions of authority, but there was actually no gain. Clearly, the boycott would have to go on for the indefinite period of time before progress was made. And lastly, the fifth uh, lesson here to learn from this journey with Martin Luther King, it says, you must innovate. And I love this part. The bus boycott created a major problem for, for, black, for Montgomery's black leadership. How do they get thousands of citizens to and from work without the benefit of public transportation? They were faced with a, with a tough problem and needed imaginative solutions. Someone called the taxi cab company and said, if you work out a deal with us, uh, work out a deal with us, we'll send all of our business to you. And they dropped the price from 40 cents to 10 cents, the same price it took to take the bus. The committee desired a clever carpool system with more than 40 pickup trucks and dispatch stations located strategically all around the city. Hundreds of people volunteered their own automobiles to drive people to and from work, to and from grocery stores and where they needed to go. People who did not uh, have to work drove all day long. Many of the jobs uh, people volunteered for were on and during their work hours, and I love this. They, the MIA purchased station wagons and dubbed them Rolling Churches and registered them as church property. I think we need rolling community and technical colleges. <laughs> Within a relatively brief period of time, more than 300 automobiles were being dispatched in a well-thought-out system that effectively moved people around town. Isn't that incredible? in such a short period of time, it gives me chills. The success of the boycott was evident early as the bus company quickly realized that a statement that they were losing 20 cents for every mile that the bus traveled, they were losing money. As a result, a wide variety of methods were attempted to assault and reduce the movement. But bus runs in some black areas were canceled, even though revenues continued to went down. The local police commissioner warned all taxi cab companies that they better start charging the full rate or we're going to fine you and we're going to stalk you all. They didn't care. They kept it 10 cents. 
They moved uh, to eliminate the taxis at the same time. City policemen began harassing and dispersing groups of people as they waited for pickup points that were designed by the MIA. And then one day, the insurance policy on the MIA station wagons were just unexpectedly canceled. Um, constant trials and tribulations, but then something happened, something very, something awful. In 1950, October 1956, Montgomery City officials finally designed a plan that would put an end to the movement. They said that the MIA's carpool was a private enterprise and was operating without a permit and reluctantly shut it down. And the book goes into very details of how, how all this happened, but ultimately it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court canceled and did not agree with city officials in canceling the, pit, the permits and shutting down the taxi service. Um, Five weeks later, after the Supreme Court decision was made and it went into effect, um, the MIA called for two more mass meetings and distributed a leaflet, and it was titled Integrated Bus Suggestions because the Supreme Court ruled that the boycott was not going to happen or that the buses had to be open and we had to let people on the bus under the three demands. Following the statement written by Martin Luther King to the community, he said, this is a time that we must, be, we must have calm, dignity, and restraint. Emotions must not run wild. Violence must not come from any of us. If we become victimized with violent intents, then we have walked in vain, and our 12 months of glorious dignity will be transformed into an eve of gloomy catastrophe. As we go back to the buses, let us be loving enough to turn an enemy into a friend. We must now move from protest to reconciliation. With this dedication, we'll be able to emerge from the bleak and desolation of midnight of man's hum inhumanity to, to men and to bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. On December 21st, 1956, I didn't know this, at 6 a.m., Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, E.D. Dixon, Rosa Parks, and Glenn Smiley, who was a white minister from Texas who supported, supported the cause, waited at a bus corner near King's home. I have decided I would not step back and watch, he remembered. I should lead them back to the buses myself. When the bus pulled up, Martin Luther King Jr. was the first to board. The bus driver greeted him with a smile and said, and made him a smile, and Martin Luther King Jr. put his fare in the box, and the bus driver said, I believe you are Reverend King, aren't you? He replied, yes, I am, and the bus driver said, we are glad to have you here this morning. Martin thanked the driver, took a seat, next to Glenn Smiley as the others boarded the bus, and then the bus pulled out. I hope many of you in this room take the time uh, to check out this book and read it. Um, I could not find it. It's actually at Ashland, and the books were checked out because we're having our Martin Luther King celebration. People are checking out books. But you can buy the book for $3, paperback on Amazon. Okay, And I'll end with this and the final words of Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, As people begin to derive inspiration from their involvement, I realize that the choice leaves you, the choice leaves your own hands. The people expect you to give them leadership. You see them growing as they move into action. And you know you no longer have a choice. You can't decide whether you want to get in or get out. You got to get in. On 1956, November 1956, he said, I've decided I would not sit back and watch, but should lead them back to the buses myself. Kevin, thank you for the time to talk to you. Free at last. Oh boy. <laughs> um, please excuse me, my voice has really been giving me some problems here for the last several weeks. And so I contemplated whether or not to even sing today. Um, but the song I'm about to sing to you it's called Free at Last. I wish, by golly, I could spread my wings and fly and let this grounded soul be free for just a little while to be like eagles when they ride upon the wind and taste the sweetest taste of freedom for my soul. And I'll be free at last, free at last. Great God Almighty, I'll 
be free at last. Let my feelings lie where harm cannot come by. And hurt this always hurting heart that needs to rest a while. I wish by golly I can spread my wings and fly. And taste the sweetest taste of freedom for my soul. And I'll be free at last. Free at last. Great God Almighty, I'll be free at last. I'd be free at last. Oh, Lord, free at last. Great God Almighty, I I'll be free at last. I'll be free at last. I'll be free at last. Great God Almighty, I'll be free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, welcome um, our Chief of Human Resources, Mr. Jackie Cecil. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin, for that beautiful rendition of Free at Last. I think you deserve another round of applause for that. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, uh, Demarcus Hobson. Uh, he is a native of Madisonville and is the oldest son of six children. As a favored public speaker and gifted orator, Hobson offers a wide range of expertise on multiple topics, including military history, historically black colleges and universities, and the black experience cultural competency, educating males of color, historically black Greek lettered fraternity and sorority life, the modern Christian experience, US history and the progressive outcomes of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. In addition to regularly contributing to the Kentucky Bluegrass Guard magazine, his work has appeared in the Madisonville Messenger, the State Journal, American Baptist Newspaper, and the United States DOD Press, to name a few. DeMarcus was honorably discharged from the United States Army after serving over 10 years in the organization. During his service, he held many leadership positions to include command state historian for the Kentucky National Guard and team leader with the 2nd 138th Field Artillery Rit Battalion of the 138th First Brigade during his deployments. With his proven leadership ability and as an avid leader in the community, Mr. Hobson is an active member in professional, civic, and community organizations. DeMarcus currently serves as a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging manager at KCTCS in Versailles. He believes our availability to, is our greatest asset and wishes to avail his gifts and talents for complete service to move the community onward, upward, and forward. Mr. Hobson is, a, is joyfully married uh, to the love of his life, Ms. Ashley Hobson, formerly Craig. They are the proud parents of two daughters, Noah Lynn and Erin Lee. Please welcome Demarcus Hobson. The test of a man is the fight that he makes, the grit that he daily shows, the way he stands upon his feet and takes life's numerous bumps and blows. A coward can smile when there's not to fear and nothing his progress bars, but it takes a man to stand and cheer while the other fellow stars. It isn't the victory after all, but the fight that a brother makes. A man, when driven against the wall, still stands erect and takes the blows of fate with his head held high bleeding, bruised, and pale, is the man who will win fate defied, for he isn't afraid to fail. 
These words ring true about the man we come to celebrate today, and that of the person of Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When we consider uh, the life that we are here to celebrate and we consider the fight and the legacy that he has established in our country and in our world, what does it mean to be bleeding, bruised, and pale? What does it mean to stand erect and take the blows of fate? What does it mean to persevere when all hell is breaking loose around us and we don't know what to do about it? What do we do when our message of hope, freedom, and love and justice may or may not want to be accepted by others? What do we do when we allow ourselves to be a martyr for justice, peace, and equality? What do we do when it's now our turn to take up the mantle? What do we do? And so, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., I'm reminded of his message that he gave to a group of young people uh, maybe three years before his assassination. He was in Philadelphia, and he asked this group of young people, he was at a junior elementary school, and he asked these young people about their blueprint. And so today, as we are uh, cataloging his life, as we've seen throughout the program today, we've heard excerpts from uh, his life story. We heard how those uh, leadership principles uh, can be refined and taken up today. We've heard his speech about his dream and the freedom uh, that he fought so harshly for and so, so fast for and so, so avidly for uh, in our country and in our nation. So the blueprint that he asked these young people about was not just about the work that was being done there but it was about their lives and their participation in the work. And so as we begin to dive into this conversation today, I would like to thank those of you that have put this program together. Let's give them another round of applause. Such a great opportunity for us to come together, the interim president here, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity. So if you would just indulge me for just a few minutes, um, I would like to take up the title for today's message or speech. Um, look at your person sitting next to you and ask them, what is your blueprint? Come on, talk to me. What is your blueprint in this life? <laughs> what is your blueprint in this life? I started the conversation today with the poem, The Test of a Man. Can we consider that Dr. King and what we understand about manhood and what we understand about leadership and what we understand about the principles that are tangible and the principles that are transferable concerning what we as a society understand those things to be. In that day, it was traditional for the man to provide. It was traditional for the man to be in front. It was traditional for the man to be uh, the, the end all be all concerning the household protection. We understand today that as time has progressed or that, that as times have progressed and that as we have become more inclusive and equitable in our approaches to work and witness, that we understand that that may not necessarily be so much the case today. But what does it mean when an individual has to take on that mantle of the day for an entire community of people? Not just their house, not just their home, not just their church or his church, but for an entire community of people. And so when we look at the blueprint of Martin Luther King, one of the things that come to mind is the relevance of what that means, right? So consider that a blueprint or what a blueprint is, right? What we know about the blueprint is that it is a document that is put together uh, for the construction of a building. Let's, let's use the building per se. Uh, for the construction of the building, it's the layout. It's the fine-tuned print of what it will be, the inside, outside, and the intricate details concerning every aspect of the building. Think about what that means for those that will take that blueprint and then make happen what you see on paper. Notice this building that we're sitting in today. This didn't just pop into thin air. Look around you. This space didn't just come to be overnight. There was a blueprint that was created and constructed that was given to someone that then built this building based on the blueprint. So what I'm trying to, to, to connect for us here today is that we understand that in order for us to get where we want to be, we have to have a blueprint to make sure that we have all the parts, pieces, and the working components to make it happen. Notice the seats that we're sitting in. How many of you all walked in today and you sat in that seat, or before you sat in that seat, you shook the chair? You tested it out. You, you put your foot on it. Anybody do that? Raise your hand if you did that. Nobody did that. Can anybody tell me why you didn't? You just sat down. Why did you come in and just sat down? 
Anybody. It's supposed to work, right? It's, it's, you, you've had relationship with it. How many of you all have sat in this room before, right? So you understand how it works. You've had relationship with the chair in, in, in a sense. You know that when you come in the room, you fold it down and you sit down because it is a chair. But understand the chair didn't just happen to be a chair. It started out as an idea. Someone had to have the idea to put it into the blueprint for the construction company to actually end up, the manufacturing company to actually end up making what you're sitting in now. So this idea and this mission that Dr. King had concerning his life's work and his life's legacy, which we heard so eloquently today, he really didn't even try to find himself in, right? He was just kind of thrown into it, but it be, he picked it up and it became his life's work. Uh, it started out as an idea. It started out as an idea. The conversation happened. They met and had a blueprint created, and then the work was done and it was established and, and change immediately happened. So what is your life's blueprint? What do we bring to the table today from the life and legacy of Dr. King that we know that we can do in our own way, in our own lives and in our own hearts to make those differences in our communities and on the college campuses that we serve. So I'm gonna give us three points and then I'll be out of your way. So point number one for our blueprints, we must have a sense of somebodyness. What that means is in our, in our, way, in, 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 in our way of doing what we know we've been called to do, we have to first understand who we are. Dr. King could not have been as successful as he was in the movement that he helped to build, shape, and direct if he didn't have a sense of somebodyness, a sense of who he was, a sense of purpose, a sense of understanding. So as we build out our blueprints and as we build out our lives to take on the steps that we need or the, the steps that are necessary for us to make positive and impactful change in our communities and on our college campuses, we have to first know who we are. We have to first understand that who we are, it matters to the movement. It matters to those that come in contact with us. It matters to the student population that we serve every single day because they're going to glean from the things that we give them based on who we are. And so we have to have a sense of somebody. And I'm reminded of, of Muhammad Ali. You will enjoy this from Louisville, right? Muhammad Ali is a son of Kentucky. We understand Muhammad Ali was a fast talker. He, he, he knew how to, to jab and shake it. He knew how to... He knew how to move, and he was the people's champion. He was the champion of the world concerning the boxing arena, but it wasn't because he was the, the strongest. He wasn't the strongest boxer. He wasn't the quickest or fastest athlete. He was not. But it was because he understood who he was and his sense of purpose and his sense of self. His speech matched his action. So not only did he tell the news and tell the media that he was the fastest and the best, a float like a butterfly, sting like a... He, right? He, not only did he do that, but he spoke those words, and because he matched what he said with what he did, he was able to perform in the ring. So what we need to do today is what we have to understand from Dr. King's legacy and message of, of a sense of purpose of, and a sense of somebodyness is that our language has to match our identity so that it matches our outcome and our work that we do. The distribution in our communities, the distribution to our students, the dis distributions to our, our talent population that are here on this campus as well. So, so um, uh, Martin Luther King... And uh, this, this notion that I'm trying to tie together concerning uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, at some point in his life and legacy, Muhammad Ali was no longer the people's champ. Because if you remember, he stood up against the war in Vietnam. And he was stripped of his title in terms of the people's champ. So he was technically stripped, but he was still the people's champ in the people's heart, right? So a lot of folks that, that left him during that time and didn't know, didn't know, did not any longer support him, uh, they just kind of left him to dry. They left him out there. But when he died, many of those folks came back to his team. The funeral was held right there in Louisville. People came from all over the world. And there were, there were folks that, that went up to the news cameras and, and wrote articles and messages about how they had left him during that time. But now they realize that he stood for something because what he stood for, st he, he stood for that because he understood who he was. It wasn't necessarily that everybody needed to agree with that, but it was because he knew who he was, right? And so what I want us to understand today, again, is that when you find your sense of purpose and drive and somebodyness, that will begin to exude on to the students, again, that we serve, the populations in our community that we serve, and you have to have that sense of somebodyness. Number two, we have to have excellence without excuse. Excellence without excuse, that does not mean to be perfect, but it means that we are not aiming toward mediocrity. 
Dr. King was not a person that wanted to be perfect. He didn't want the system to be perfect. He wanted the system to be excellent. He wanted the system to be fair. He wanted the system to be just. We know that things are never going to be perfect. But when we strive for excellence, the equity and the belonging that comes into those places and spaces will eventually show themselves to be so because we are striving not for mediocrity, but striving for excellence. How many of us know that the students that come to our campus, uh, they oftentimes will just do bare minimum just to get the grade, right? How many of us have ever, as, as talent and, 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 and folks uh, that, that work on campus, we've just shown some days are just better than others. You just come to work and you do what you need to do, and then you head to the house. You're not doing anything extra today. I'm just shooting to, to hit the bar. But when excellence is our, is our standard, when excellence is what we do, when excellence is our call to action, when excellence is, is the norm, what we typically find is on our worst days, excellence is still the option. What we find when we, when we come up and show up to the classroom and we're full of energy and we're full of life and we're ready to give our students exactly what they deserve because they deserve excellence, they'll perform better and they'll do better. Understand that when a student walks into a classroom, we have to have expectations of excellency for them. If a student walks into a classroom and there's no expectation, we as the professionals ought to be ashamed and the students ought to be offended because they deserve an expectation. When they show up to the financial aid office, when they show up to the business office, when they show up to the registrar, we ought to service them with excellence without an excuse, without any options. Because when we give them what we want from them, they'll begin to exude that for themselves. And it will run rapid in our communities every single day. I'm reminded of something that Dr. King said. He said, if you're going to do it, do it better than anybody else that could ever do it. He said, do it so well that those that are living, dead, or unborn couldn't do it better than you. Now, I always often said when I was a classroom teacher, nobody can teach better than me. I knew teachers could. There were folks that could teach circles around me. But I spoke it into existence in terms of what I believe, right? And what my students picked up on was, they said, dang, he think he's the best student, so we must be the best student, uh, best teacher, so we must be the best students. And so we began to have this challenge with one another, who could be the best that day, who could strive for excellence that day, and that's how we bought, how I, I was able to get them to buy in to the work that we were attempting to do. And so with this blueprint that Dr. King is talking about, excellence was not an option for him. Excellence was not an option in the movement. We just heard the excerpt from the leadership book, how they came together in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense of excellence, and everybody did their part. Folks drove. Folks bought vehicles. Folks used their personal vehicles. They had church vans running. They did what they could do in a sense of excellence to ensure that the movement did not lack anything. And so as we're giving of our service and ourselves to our, our, our college students and into our communities, excellence has to be the standard. And last but not least, we must have an unwavering commitment uh, to persevere. How many of y'all have ever had to persevere? Yeah, yeah. Life is hard. I can stand here today and I can run a litany of Dr. King quotes. I can stand here today and I can give a chronological order of his life from birth to death. I could, I could stand here today and I could tell us about all of the excellent things that Dr. King has done. And I think we all know those things. What this season, what this time really means for me, as a DEI leader, DIB leader, what it means for me is that we are to reflect on the work that Dr. King has done. It's not to just list what, he, what all he did, but it is to reflect on the impact of the work that he did. And the impact would not be what it is or what it was or what it was and what it is had he not persevered. Understand that his family were, was threatened every single day. Can you imagine being on the road, your significant other is at home, receiving death threats, someone telling you that, that your children are not going to live, throwing bricks through your window, you having to have personal security around your home? Imagine not knowing if you're going to take a trip and then come back to your family. Imagine being the spokesman for an entire movement that people are for and people are against. Imagine being a spokesman for an entire community and you're just a lowly old Baptist preacher in the South. Imagine having to carry that weight, what it means to persevere, what it means to have hardship and still getting the job done, what it means to struggle and still get the job done. What it means to, to, to not have it all together and still want to do a good job to ensure that the community advances as a whole. So I don't have any, any students in the room, so I was going to do a demonstration. But I do want us to, to consider 
something here about perseverance. One thing that we have to know about perseverance is we have to have a driving agent. Everybody say a real loud driving agent. Say a real loud driving agent. We have to figure out what our driving agent is. And I think as a system of schools, our driving agent should be and is our students. Outside of our system, what is your driving agent? What do you do every day? Why do you get up every day and do what you do? Why do you wake up every day, get out of bed, as tired as you may be? I heard somebody say family. What else? Commitment. A fight. Right? There's a reason that we get up and do what we do. So I'm reminded of the Alaskan Cod Company. The Alaskan Cod Company, they were about to go bankrupt. And they were going bankrupt because they were farming these fish. They were, they, were, they, were, they were fishing and capturing these fish in Alaska, these, these waters. And then they would travel all the way around. They would bring them down to Florida and put them in the market to sell. Well, what they found on about five of their trips is that when they finally made it to Florida on this three-day journey, that half of their load on the ship was dead and the other half couldn't be sold because the, the, the flesh was weak, the meat was tender, and no one would buy the fish. So this, this company, after only five trips, lost millions and millions of dollars, and they were getting ready to go bankrupt. So what they had to do is they had to come to the table. They had to bring all the pieces to the table. They had to have their blueprint ready and prepared, right? So they had to bring the, 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 the key individuals to the table, and they had to have this think tank, and they had to have these, these conversations about how do we ensure that we don't go bankrupt. And so what they found was that the fish were just kind of coasting along the way. On this three-day journey, they were not in their natural environment. They were not in their natural element, and they were just coasting along the way. The fish weren't moving. They were just coasting. And so they said, if the fish are just coasting, this is why they're dying. So they put a camera in the tank on the next journey, knowing they were going to lose millions. They knew it. But they just wanted to see what was happening in that tank. Lo and behold, the fish were just coasting. Everybody do like this. Everybody do like this. Everybody do like this. Everybody coast with me. Everybody coast with me. Right? So they were just coasting. And what happened when they got to Florida? Half the tank was dead. The other half couldn't be sold. Another million dollars lost. So they figured out what the problem was. The blueprint showed them what the problem was. But the blueprint also had, a, had an answer. Because the blueprint is both question and answer. It's call and response. It's rhetorical and responsive, right? So they figured out how to get the fish to, or they knew they had to figure out how to get the fish to move. They did some research. And they found that the catfish is the natural adjutant to the codfish. And so what they did is, they purchased a bunch of catfish, loaded up the cod, put it in the tank, and they dumped those catfish in the tank with the cod. What do you think happened? Oh, they fought the whole way to Florida. I mean, they fought the whole way to Florida. For three days, the, the, the cat are nipping at the cod, and the cod are nipping at the cat, and they're running, they're jumping. For three days, they fought. So when they finally got to Florida, not only did they have a good batch, but the fish were stronger than they were when they were caught because they were moving. The fish were healthier than they were when they were caught because they were moving. They had a sense of purpose. They had a sense to live. They had a reason to fight. They had a reason to live. And so they were at, the company was able to find a way to not go into bankruptcy because they figured out what was happening to their fish. So my question to us today as we find our blueprint, as we move, toward, move together toward change, what is our driving agent? What is the thing that's going to keep us from being stagnant? What is the thing that's going to keep us rechecking our blueprint to make sure we're building it right? What, is it going to, what are we going to do to keep us to, to, to remember that the blueprint is both question and answer? It gives us the question, we, we need a building. The answer is, this is how we do it. And that driving agent that causes us to wake up every single day, our families, our commitment, our students, our heart, our passion, our drive, our purpose, right? That's what we have, to, we have to use as our driving agent to ensure that we don't just become stagnant and we just ride the waves. Because riding the waves is not going to make a change. Riding the waves is not what Dr. King did. Dr. King was an adjutant. He was a natural adjutant, and the movement was a natural adjutant to the way society was structured at that time. And we are beneficiaries of seeds we did not plant. So the, the seeds that were planted during, it, during that time and during that movement, we now reap the benefits of those things because they did not stay stagnant. The catfish were thrown into the tank. 
The natural adjectives were thrown into the tank, and now we can see and reap the benefits of what we saw or what was happening during that day. There may be some of us sitting in the room or watching online, and you may have been alive during that time. And you're now seeing where our country was then in terms of blueprint and where our country is now. I want you to think about and consider those of you all that were alive at that time. What have you done to ensure that we're not coasting? What lessons have been passed down at the kitchen table to ensure that we have not or that we are not coasting? What are we doing concerning diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in our workplaces and spaces? What are we doing to ensure that our students feel welcome when they walk into the office? What are we doing to be that natural adjutant to ensure that we have, that we work toward positive change in our communities and in this culture? So as we think about the blueprint and as we move toward change in the 21st century, I want us to consider, find yourself always revisiting the blueprint. Thank you. Your blueprint, what is it that your life is requiring of you? That old song that people say, um, I want it all and I want it now. One of the things we have to remember is that, number one, you can't have it all. You can have all that life has for you, but not what all life has for me. I want to take you back to the film that we watched a second with Martin Luther King. And if you were paying attention, you would, you would notice that they were not all black. Change will not come about in our society by one culture, but by a mixture of those cultures coming together to provoke and not stop, to agitate until change comes. But the first step is that that change must start in you. Each and every one of us must look upon ourselves and ask about that change. Before we close tonight, I, today, this afternoon, I'm even lost as to what time of the day it is. <laughs> I would like to... Uh, Attempt another song, one that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And I might need some help. And so, you know, I may call somebody up to help me out with this song. So be ready. <laughs> I see trees of green, rose, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you, and I say to myself, what a wonderful world. Come on, help me out. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark starry night. And I say to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. Also on the faces of friends coming by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll know much more than I'll ever know. And I say to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, I say to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, yeah. 
as we go today, I want you to remember, regardless of the trials and tribulations that we have to face and all the things we go through, we do live in a wonderful world. I'm reminded of years ago, I was working with an alternative school in Huntington, West Virginia, and I was driving down a back alley and it was just filled with trash. And I remember just asking, all this garbage, every day you're seeing all this garbage. It transferred over to life. In life, you just see all this stuff that's not good. And I stopped for some unknown reason in the alleyway amidst all that garbage. And I looked to my left, and there was a weed that had grown up. And in that weed was a bluebird. And it was just a singing. Even amongst the garbage, there's beauty. If we know our blueprint in life, we will learn how to navigate the garbage. Let's close with prayer. Most gracious and everlasting Father God, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know what we want to do, you know what you've created us to do. All of us have a role to play. As we gather together in unity, may we take the spirit of moving forward with us. May we discover and crystallize the blueprint for our lives, and that you be glorified in that. That we reach out to our neighbors and Father, even to those we like and don't like. That we can move forward together during this time. We pray for each and every one of us that are here today and those that have joined us online, that the blueprint for their life becomes crystal clear. Bless each and every one of us as we move forward in unity. In your Holy Son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This concludes our Martin Luther King Day celebration. Thank you all for coming up.